Good morning. It is a blessing to be back, be back home. We're thankful for the Lord's protection while we've been traveling. Um, thankful for uh, the opportunity to have... I'm, I'm thankful that the Lord gave me a faithful grandfather. Um, I would say it is easy to eulogize a good man. And Grandpa's eulogy was a, an easy one to write and an easy one to present. Um, we're so thankful for all of y'all's prayers while we were away. Um, let's turn in our Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. We're going to begin this morning in verse 27. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. For if he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says the old is good. Let's pray together. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for the many blessings that you have given us today. Father, I pray that as we consider the example of Levi, we consider our own response to you. That just as Levi rose and followed your son, leaving everything behind, that we also are to rise and follow you. Now, Father... I especially want us to learn from his example today uh, and how he made that response and the attitude that he had about it. I pray, Father, that you help us to learn penitence. Help us, Father, to learn to take joy in your salvation. Holy Father, we thank you for the blood that you have given us, the blood of your Son that cleanses us of our sins and makes us holy. Father, we're thankful for the hope that we have in the resurrection. For these things, Father, we rejoice and are glad, and we offer thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. This is one of those situations where we need to acknowledge that every once in a while the Pharisees have a point, and they're more right than we normally allow them to be. The Pharisees, they normally get to be our whipping boys. Right, because they're constantly wrong, they are constantly opposing Jesus. But here, they're right about a few things. Um, whenever they object to Jesus eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners, they bring this objection forward for a couple of reasons that I think we ought to agree with. Not that we agree to their objection overall, but we agree to this. They see Jesus as righteous, at least in comparison with his table mates. So they come to the disciples and they say, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And they wouldn't object to tax collectors and sinners eating with other tax collectors and sinners. So why are they objecting to Jesus dining with sinners? It's because in some sense, I mean, not nearly enough, but in some sense, they see Jesus as belonging in their same general class. Jesus is part of the holy people. They consider Jesus to be dedicated to God, a good Jew, in almost every way except the ones that they grumble about. And it just so happens that they're wrong in all of the ways that they grumble about. 
um, that Jesus is actually better at doing this thing than they are. But they are right in seeing Jesus as righteous, at least. And they are right to call Jesus' dinner company a bunch of sinners. Uh, We have to say that because Jesus himself says it. Jesus does not object to their label here. Whenever he says, why are you, whenever they say, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus does not say, now hold on now, wait a minute here. Who are you to judge? Those are not sinful people over there. Those are decent folks sitting at the table with me. Jesus, Jesus just lets the uh, objection go as it is. And he admits, in fact, that he is dining with sinners in his answer. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so the Pharisees are right when they say that Jesus is dining with tax collectors and sinners. And the Pharisees are also right to be concerned about sin, to object to sin, to see sin as a bad thing, obviously. And Jesus is just as concerned as they are about it. Because again, he says, I've come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. But Jesus and the Pharisees are together on this point, that sinners need to repent. And we're right there with them. Where we disagree with the Pharisees is where Jesus disagrees with the Pharisees in their response to the sinners. The Pharisees' response, you have to understand how the Pharisees saw themselves and how they saw sin. The Pharisees saw themselves as holy and dedicated to the Lord, and sin is a naturally uh, corrupting influence. If you go back and you read the Law of Moses... Um, you'll notice that most of these laws about clean and unclean uh, do two things. First off, if you are unclean under the law, your uncleanness can contaminate other people. And that is all over the law, particularly in Leviticus. If you are unclean under the law, your uncleanness can make other people unclean. And so if you are If you're clean ceremonially under the law, you have to take great care to keep yourself clean. Um, And the other thing that you need to know about these laws is that often, whenever the period of uncleanness is done, you are required to go to the temple and offer sacrifices. Among them, guilt offerings and sin offerings. So in other words, clean and unclean, this this is often a matter of sin, whenever you're looking at the law. And that uncleanness can contaminate. And so from the Pharisaic perspective, being around sinners, their sin can rub off on you. And so the Pharisaic response is to shun these sinners. Jesus' response is to call them to repentance. Now, we've emphasized this point on several occasions already as we've looked at Luke's Gospel. But Jesus... As opposed to the Pharisees, Jesus is there to reach out to people who are out on the margins, to proclaim good news to the poor, right? And we've talked about lepers, we've talked about Gentiles, uh, we've talked about widows, we've talked about all sorts of people who are out on the margins of society and, and in the ancient Near Eastern way of looking at things. And Jesus says, I'm here to reach out to them. And in this case, that includes... Tax collectors and sinners. I am here to reach out to them. That's why he's dining with them. Whereas the Pharisees are concerned with actually creating those margins and sending people out to those margins. But the Pharisees, though, they've asked Jesus a valid question. I mean, it's valid in the sense that they mean it. Um... You know, with their understanding of the law. And Jesus gives them an answer that satisfies the law. But from our perspective even, the Pharisees are asking Jesus a valid question that we need to consider. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Not just why are you keeping company with tax collectors and sinners, but why of all the things that you could be doing with them, Why are you eating and drinking with them? 
consider this whole episode here and what's going on, what this is supposed to signify to us. Jesus, in verse 27, goes out and he sees the tax collector, Levi, and he tells him, follow me. And Levi, leaving everything, rose and followed him. All right, now, we've seen this pattern before, by the way. Go back to the beginning of the chapter, Luke chapter 5. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down, and he taught the people from the boat. And after he had finished speaking... He said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they had enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both their boats so that they began to sink. But when Peter saw it, and here notice Peter's response, when Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And notice what Peter does here. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. All right, now, to our minds, this, this kind of episode makes sense that Jesus is calling a man like Peter, uh, that he is conscripting him as a disciple, and that's explicitly what he's doing here. From now on, you will be catching men, Jesus says. And so Peter's response to that is to leave everything and follow Jesus. And so now Luke throws us a curveball because he shows us the exact same thing happening, except now instead of... A, a, you know, a proper Jewish man, now it's happening to Levi, a tax collector. And Jesus comes to him and says, follow me. And Levi leaves everything and follows Jesus, just as Peter left everything to follow Jesus. And so we get the sense here that Jesus is not just asking Levi, hey, you want to go on a walk with me? That's not the kind of follow me that Jesus has in mind here. He's calling him to discipleship. And just as Peter left everything to follow Jesus, so does Levi. Levi is responding to a call for discipleship. And just as Peter was penitent, falling on his knees before Jesus and saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord, so too is this calling of Levi the tax collector centered on repentance. That's what Jesus says. But what he's doing here is part of his broader calling. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So in other words, what's happening with Levi here is in some ways a a retelling or a replaying of what happened with Peter. And this is where we get a little confused. Because Jesus is saying this, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. In other words, he's showing us that Levi's response is a penitent response. Jesus is showing us that at a feast. The problem for us is that Levi's feast doesn't look like penitence to us. Eating and drinking doesn't look like repentance to us. And it didn't look like repentance to them either. That's why they turn around and ask. They say, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers. So the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours, eat and drink. All right, they're just stating an observation, but it's, it's obvious that they're, they're really raising an objection here. Ooh. If your ministry is really about repentance, then why are we talking about eating and drinking? Why is this happening at the middle of a feast? Because to us, penitence looks like Peter, falling on your knees and saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. 
it looks like, and remember, Peter here is hearkening back to Isaiah in that great throne room scene in Isaiah 6, where Isaiah is confronted with the Lord and he falls down and he says, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. That looks like penitence to us. To us, penitence looks like fasting and sackcloth and ashes. That's why they've brought this up here, that the disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees, they fast. That's what penitence is supposed to look like, right? And it's no coincidence for us, by the way, that for a long time we've been in the habit of calling prisons penitentiaries. And we still call them that. If somebody says that they've got 10 years in the state pen, pen doesn't mean a cage. Pen is an abbreviation for penitentiary, which is a place where you go to learn penitence. That's that's the idea that we have about the prison system, is that criminals, rather than throwing criminals into prison just to remove them from society and put them out on the margins, the idea is that we ought to teach them penitence and rehabilitate them so they can rejoin society. And in some sense, it's a gospel idea. Right, the idea that you ought to be taking people on the margins and incorporating them more into society. That's the idea of the penitentiary. But that whole system tells us a lot about our idea of penitence. Because what penitence looks like in our imagination is jail. That's what penitence looks like to us. And so what is Jesus doing here feasting as part of His ministry of repentance? It makes no sense to us. It does not look penitent what Levi is doing here. And this is apparently not a one-off behavior for Jesus because the observation that they raise here, that the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink... Apparently, this was a pattern for Jesus and for His disciples. It had been going on apparently long enough for people to take notice and to say, this characterizes your ministry, Jesus. Right? The ministry of John, I mean, the, boy, that looked penitent, didn't it? He's clothed in camel's hair. He's living out in the wilderness, uh, living off of locusts and wild honey. And he's standing by the river and he is preaching fire. And he is definitely preaching repentance. That's why he gets so many people baptized in the river. That looks like a penitent ministry. But Jesus, your ministry, you're eating and drinking. What is going on here? And here, we need to throw on the brakes just a minute and say that fasting is a valid and godly form of penitence. Jesus himself says so here. If we look at his response, he says, The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. And obviously, fasting is a form of penitence. Um, Look at Joel chapter 2. Go to the prophet Joel. The law and the prophets, by the way, have a lot to say about Um, about fasting and about penitence. In Joel chapter 2, at the beginning of the chapter, the Lord is basically telling uh, His people that they are going to be overrun by a foreign army because of their sins. And it it looks horrible what's going to happen to them. But in verse 12... Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And He relents over disaster. Who knows whether He will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind Him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people. And so yes, being solemn, 
fasting, those are valid forms of penitence. But that doesn't answer our question. Just to observe that fasting is a valid form of penitence, it doesn't answer the question, well, why isn't Jesus doing it then? Why aren't Jesus' disciples doing it? Why isn't Levi doing it, since he is a disciple of Jesus now? Why is it that Jesus' ministry of repentance right here is about feasting and merrymaking? We find the answer to this, yeah, there's a twofold response. Um, part of that answer we find in what feasts represented in the ancient world. And it's not so different from what they represent in our day. Um, Turn to Luke chapter 15. I want us to look at just little segments of some parables that we read several weeks ago. Luke chapter 15. Um, Notice, we'll just read through the parables briefly. We'll start um, at the beginning. The tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, like they're grumbling here in Luke 5. This man receives sinners and eats with them. Same objection. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. But why does he call his friends together? He calls them together to rejoice in what has happened. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, notice again, she does exactly the same thing. She calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. But the last parable here really drives the point home. The parable of the prodigal son. Now remember, the the man in this story has two sons. One of them is faithful and hardworking. The other is a... Well, he's... Lazy. He's prodigal. He's a spendthrift. He takes his part of the inheritance early. He goes out and squanders it on just garbage living and then predictably finds himself in dire poverty so that he uh, is so hungry that he wishes he could eat hog slop, but he doesn't have a right to it. And so he says, well, I'll return home and I'll throw myself at my father's mercy. And we'll see what happens. Notice his father's response. When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I'll arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. So in all three of these occasions where there's this lost thing that gets found, the response at the finding is, we need to get everybody together. We need to feast. Uh, And that comes out explicitly here in this last parable. The father throws a feast for his son. Not just because he thinks his son is hungry, not just because he likes to eat lots of food, but because the feast, the banquet, is a traditional expression of joy. You're not just saying, oh, I'm rich and I've got a lot of food I can feed you. You're rejoicing. And that is the occasion for holding the banquet. Levi here is 
publicly rejoicing over what Jesus has brought into his life. Jesus has called him and he has followed. And so Levi's response at receiving this calling and being able to follow is to rejoice by throwing this feast. What Levi tells, it teaches us here in Luke 5, and what these parables teach us here in Luke 15, is that penitence is not just a somber matter. Indeed, having one's sins forgiven is one of the most joyful things that can happen. This is plastered all over the Psalms, by the way. If you, uh, if you look for the word salvation in the Psalms, you will almost always find it accompanied by rejoicing. I take joy in your salvation, O Lord. I rejoice in your salvation. We see this especially come out in Psalm 40. Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. And I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let those who put to shame and disappoint altogether... Sorry, let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, Aha! Aha! But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. So here we see the psalmist contending with his sin, his iniquity surrounds him, and the Lord saves him from it. And the psalmist's response is to rejoice. Right, the Lord has put a song of praise in his mouth, and he sings that song. He does not withhold his joy in the news of this salvation from the great congregation. Because that is a godly response to salvation. That in itself is a form of penitence. One other text that I want us to consider. Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61. Remember, it's from the beginning of Isaiah 61 that Jesus reads at the synagogue of Nazareth. He reads those first few verses, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has appointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's what Jesus reads from. At the end of this chapter, a few verses later, verse 10, 
Isaiah also writes this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom. Notice the metaphor that Isaiah uses here. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden cause, sorry, causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. Now, what did Jesus compare himself to, by the way? Whenever, the, uh, whenever they were asking, well, the disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees, they fast. But your disciples, they eat and they drink. Remember what Jesus says to them. He says, Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? He uses exactly the same comparison that Isaiah uses here. Isaiah says that God has clothed him with the garments of salvation, so he will take joy. He doesn't throw off those garments to take on sackcloth and ashes, but he wears those garments in joy. So if we take the whole witness of the prophets and the law, we can see that there's a season for somber penitence. Uh, Think, for example, of King David after his sin with Bathsheba has been revealed. He sits in sackcloth and ashes and he fasts while Bathsheba's uh, child is lying sick. He is penitent with a somber heart. But there's also a season for joyful penitence, joyful repentance, and that is what Levi is showing here. And by the way, notice that that, the response of Levi here is mirrored by the response of God in Luke chapter 15. Who's putting on the feast? Who's rejoicing in all of those parables in Luke chapter 15? It's not the one being found. It's not the sheep. It's not the coin. It's not the son. It's the one who found them. It's the shepherd. It's the woman. It's the father. They're the ones throwing the feasts. They're the ones rejoicing. And Jesus explains those parables. I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So as we encounter our own salvation, as we encounter penitence with joy, the angels of God are doing the same, Jesus says. And so one thing is we consider our our service to God. Again, we have to bear in mind that it just because of our upbringing, because of our background, we want to shove penitence into just this one little spot that says you need to be serious and have a long face. Uh, you should not be happy about this. You need to be reserved about it. What we need to do is accept the scriptural teaching of penitence, that repentance is much broader than that. And we also need to accept that whether we're fasting or whether we're feasting, our fast and our feast must bear the fruit of repentance. Because it's possible to do both of those things without any sort of penitence in the heart. Turn to Zechariah chapter 7. Questions about fasting are pretty common in Scripture. One is considered here in Zechariah 7. The beginning of the chapter, In the fourth year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, which is Chislev. Now the people of Bethel had sent Sherezer and Regamelech and their men to entreat the favor of the Lord, saying to the priests of the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophets, Should I weep and abstain in the fifth month, as I have done for so many years? Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, Say to all the people of the land and the priests, 
When you fasted and mourned in the fifth month and in the seventh, for these seventy years, the seventy years that they've been in captivity, when you did all that fasting and weeping and mourning, was it for me that you fasted? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no, they didn't. And when you eat and when you drink, do you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Were not these the words that the Lord proclaimed by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and prosperous with their cities around her and the south and the lowland were inhabited? In other words, the Lord, I mean, the Lord honestly kind of brushes off their question here. This is not really a legitimate question. Y'all are not interested in serving me whether you're fasting or whether you're feasting. Because in all of your fasting and your weeping, you didn't do it for me. In all of your eating and all of your drinking, you did it for yourselves. So whether we're fasting or whether we're feasting, we have to see to it that repentance is there. That we are bearing the fruit of repentance because it's possible to do both of these things selfishly. Turn to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah says, Cry aloud, do not hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask me, they ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and He will say, Here I am. So long as the fasting, so long as whatever it is you're doing does not bear the fruits of repentance, so long as you are not godly about it, it will do you no good. But if it bears fruits in keeping with repentance, then that's when the blessings of the Lord come in. That's when you shall call and the Lord will answer. That's when you shall cry and He will say, Here I am. So the call for us today is to be penitent, to acknowledge our sins before the Lord, to pray for forgiveness, to turn away from sin, and to rejoice whenever we receive that forgiveness, knowing that God is faithful through the blood of Christ to remove our sins from us but knowing that we must bear fruit in keeping with repentance. It is as John the Baptist said in Luke chapter 3. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. 
Levi was bearing fruits in keeping with repentance, or Jesus wouldn't have commended him. The Pharisees, though they seemed more righteous, were not bearing fruits in keeping with repentance. We can choose this day which of those camps we fall into. Are we penitent? Are we joyful about it? Are we following through on it? That is the call this day that I want you to consider. If you have not taken on the name of Christ, if you've not been baptized for the remission of your sins, we invite you to do that today. Because it is obedience that is pleasing to God. Or perhaps you've obeyed Him, but have turned away from that calling. You have not borne fruits in keeping with repentance. We invite you to return to that calling, to, as Levi, to leave everything and follow Jesus. Whatever your need is, we can uh, certainly help you and address that this morning. If you'll come forward as together we stand and sing. Our Holy Father, we're thankful again that we've had this privilege and this another opportunity to come here.